Risk of Rain 2 is a third-person roguelike shooter where you can choose from a selection of unique survivors, with your options being a dude whose gimmick is that he has none, a lady that makes the developers regret adding modding capabilities, a poison dog, a robot plant that 3% of the player base actually main and enjoy playing, a shopping cart, plus a bunch of other friends. Once you pick your survivor, take in the sprawling environments and begin destroying the ecosystem and its inhabitants. Along the way, you steal the lunch money of a lizard you just shot and use it to open a funny box, and it all comes together when you die 5 minutes later to a mountain that just shot you with a hitscan laser beam. At least that's what happens for most new players, but if you have at least some learning capacity and have died to the hands of a Malachite Lesser Wisp on more than one occasion, then congratulations, you already know why this game is FUN. In all seriousness, there's a lot that makes Risk of Rain 2 stand out as a roguelike on its own and a supplemental game to the first, and that's what this video aims to kind of showcase. If you're watching this, then I know that you know that I know what an iceberg image is, so I won't go into detail explaining what it is. This one has 10 tiers on it, and I'll do my best to try to explain everything on it, but if something is wrong or not that well explained, then feel free to correct me. I've added a couple things, not too many, uh, that aren't on the original image, but I think it just kind of adds to the flow of it, in my opinion, and also hopes to at least show some new stuff to new people who aren't super familiar with the game but want to get into it. I didn't make the iceberg image myself, uh, credit goes to Overfrosted on the Risk of Rain 2 subreddit, he's the guy who actually made the iceberg itself and explained all the tiers on it, so huge shout out to him. With that out of the way, it's time to talk about the Risk of Rain 2 iceberg. Mythrix is Providence's brother. It's pretty much exactly what it says it is. The final boss of the first game is the brother of the final boss of the second game. There's going to be a lot of stuff explaining the lore between the two and what they've done for the overall Risk of Rain universe. So just know that they're related. In the first game, there's a green quality item called Tough Times, and now in the second game, it's the same item, but a lot more deteriorated and has a weakened effect. When in the first game, it had a flat armor bonus, now it's a lot more inconsistent and only has a chance of straight up blocking damage. The anniversary update changed a few of the mastery skins since a lot of them used to be simple recolors. So for example, Huntress got a coat, Artificer got a robe, but the biggest one was Rex got blue bulbs for his original one and then it got turned to more of a summery yellow color than it is today. In my opinion, I like the original mastery skin. I think it looked a lot more distinct and cooler, but that's just my opinion. Artificer isn't human is a reference to the fact that her head shape isn't the same as like the rest of the survivors, but it could just be the shape of her helmet, but then it doesn't really make sense as to why it looks so long in the back and why there'd be so much empty space if she was a regular human. And her logbook entry talks about her being a part of the High Court. The main purpose of the court itself is to find heaven, which they believe to be a planet, and I'm assuming Artificer was sent to the planet to go try to find it and was eventually caught by the Newt, or maybe Mythrix in some way, and imprisoned into the Newt shop, and that's why you find her there to begin with. Handy was a character from the first game. He's a lot like Multi, so I guess Multi is just an upgraded version of Handy, so he's obsolete, just taking a nap in the back. Sleep easy, King. Loader in Risk of Rain 2 is female. Loader in Risk of Rain 1 is male. There's not really a whole lot else to add, but it segues perfectly into the next point. The survivors from Risk 1 and Risk 2 are different people. So the anniversary update gave us even more proof of this idea, since you find a bunch of dead commandos on commencement. Essentially, each of the characters is kind of a job, less than like an individual. So there's going to be multiple engineers, multiple commandos, multiple loaders, etc. However, the only exception to that rule is Acrid since he seems to be one of a kind. Tier 2 is mostly the same kind of stuff, but a lot of it will be inside logbook entries. So this is the first thing that isn't on the original iceberg that I'm putting on just because I felt like putting it on. So these are two things used for mod management and getting mods for the game itself. So check these two out if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Deadbolt is a side-scrolling stealth action game released by Hopu Games in 2016. Soulbound Catalyst is a reference to Reaper, the player character in Deadbolt, and Bandit's Mastery skin is a reference to Ibzan, the final boss. The Owlie Vultures on Siren's Call and Scorched Acres are a lot smarter than they lead on. They're capable of understanding human technology and are actually capable of reverse engineering it. In their logbook entry, it is stated that they can use guns. I don't know, in my mind, it just kind of conjures up images of like New York pigeons 
growing up eating pizza and have since evolved and now they stay strapped. Everyone's at least seen one Newt statue in a run at some point or another, but no one has understood who has put them there or why they're there to begin with. It just leaves a lot to speculate. Grove Tender as a sloth is just a reference to his appearance. He's actually just an alien underneath his mask, but he just has the appearance of a sloth. The Stone Titans sort of rise from the ground whenever they spawn, with that implication being that they've always been buried underground wherever you fight them. The logbook entry reads, Compared to the golems of the planet, the titans do not seem to be created on the spot, but emerge from underground. Are they kept there for safekeeping, or are they imprisoned? Were they created as weapons, or as guardians? Janner and Multi, being a reference to Handy, is pretty obvious. They have the same color palette and they both have a hat. I already talked about Handy before, so I'm not going to add a whole lot else. And the log entries for the wax coil and the rose buckler, you can find that they were sent from the same family members, one from a father and one from a mother. The quail entry talks about how the mother found a new bakery recently, and the father has taken up wilting wax, and the buckler's entry is just the dad saying mom also sent a package over. The Murrians have been shown to be highly social and peaceful creatures around everyone except humans since the first game, and have a language capable of making songs. The same can be said for most of Pechator 5's wildlife, honestly. They're all just kind of kicking back, vibing out, and then we show up and kill them all. This is a line spoken by Mithrix whenever he kills one of your drones or turrets if you're playing Engineer. It's kind of ironic that he considers a construct stronger when he can't overpower a Bungus turret. Okay, so here's where the overarching lore of Risk of Rain 2 starts to get explained a little bit. And just for a bit of context, beings on the planet were created by Mithrix and Providence using four compounds. Them being soul, blood, design, and mass and crafted inside of the Bulwark's Ambry, the place where you get all of your artifacts. The important one here is Soul, because Aurelianite was a construct created by Providence using too much Soul, giving it a lot of power and it could rival the strength of both Mithrix and Providence. As a result, this created an imbalance in the ratios, as Mithrix puts it in the Halcyon Seed Lockbook. This leads to Aurelianite being sealed away in the hidden realm called the Gilded Coast, and Mithrix being in charge of the creations of new constructs to prevent this from happening again. Moving on to Tier 3. Some people may have noticed that I'm a fake gamer and a cheater, and also this isn't an entry on the iceberg, but there's a way to get infinite lunar coins if you go in and edit the text files for the game. To do so, you go to your C drive, program files, x86, Steam, user data, Whatever number shows up, I'm pretty sure it's just a Steam ID, but it doesn't matter what the actual number is. 632360, remote, then user profiles. There you can access the text files for the game and control F coins and edit whatever the number next to it is. I personally don't care too much about it, but there are some people who are like super gatekeepy about whether or not you text file it in Lunar Coins, but if you do it, that's fine. I personally don't care, like I said. But if you choose to do it, just remember to make a copy of the unedited text file so you don't accidentally corrupt yours and mess up your save data. There's references all over the game about a deity referred to as Nukahana. Supposedly, she's like a goddess of death and balance, and there's a bunch of other entries in the game that'll explain more about her lore. And there's some entries on the iceberg image itself that'll explain more. The Wicked Ring is an item from the first game that reduces your cooldowns every single time you land a crit, and the Soulbound Catalyst log entry indicates that these two items are from the same kind of origin. The origin for these two items being in the court of an unknown king who used these items in sacrificial rituals in order to ward off ill omens, and the sacrifices being the sons of the king himself. The ritual didn't originate from the king, but existed way before his time. It's also implied that the ritual has some association to Nukahana, but that's just speculation. Kurskon is the name of the heretic character, who is an alloy vulture influenced by Mithrix through placements of lunar items on the planet. To play as the heretic, you have to buy all four pieces of the heresy lunar items in the bazaar or in lunar pods. Similar to Nukahana, more is going to be explained later in the iceberg. There's multiple instances of Morse code being hidden throughout the game, the most popular one being in Siren's Call, where there's a core that flashes and says Updog. This isn't like a haha -ha funny or anything, it actually says Updog in Morse code. Also, Multi on the character select screen says a bunch of Zs. The log for Bustling Fungus depicts nobody in particular arguing with someone else over only eating Bustling Fungus. It reads like a stereotypical vegan confrontation and pokes fun at it while it talks about how only eating mushrooms isn't healthy, in a similar way that eating only meat or vegetables isn't. 
In actuality, it probably just references the fact that Engineer is the only character that uses bustling fungus. The scavenger doesn't really have any, like, holistic purpose in life, he's just there to hoard stuff. Scavenger's probably one of the few characters in this game that'd be friendly if the players didn't shoot everything on sight. Elite aspects are rare equipments that can occasionally drop from elites. It's by default around a 1 in 4,000 chance, but that drop chance is affected by luck. They count as equipment items and make your character look cooler if you have them on, but in my opinion, the regular equipment outcompetes them by a large margin. I like for these items to at least be red or yellow quality instead of being an equipment, but that just might be wishful thinking. There are several references to glass frogs throughout the game. The room where you spawn in on commencement will have a glass frog if you reach it during the detonation countdown. It doesn't really do anything, but it's a, it's a cute little frog. Glass frogs are also mentioned in the purity logbook, where it mentions two brothers chasing glass frogs in the sun, a reference to a younger Mithrix and Providence. The log for Rex talks about how a few scientists tasked with overseeing robots that will help grow different variants of alien plants. Rex is the only one that actually manages to grow the alien cabbages because it develops a symbiotic relationship with the plant. After the scientists are told to shut Rex down, Rex almost certainly manages to kill them all in self-defense. Gnarled wood sprites were used in hospitals to help treat the sick. However, it could be a placebo because the healing comes from the light that it emits. Even if it is a placebo, it seems like it's a good thing to have around people. It seemingly improves the moods of those it's around with the light show it performs. When you die to a Void Reaver explosion, you are detained and told to await your sentence at the end of time. The logbook also mentions detaining someone trying to fight it, where the Void Reaver compels them to freeze and take something from them. It's also implied that the encounter takes place in the Void Fields, which bear many similarities to the Void Reavers themselves. You also unlock Acrid by beating the Void Fields, so it also kind of leads to the idea that the Void Reavers are taking things and locking them inside the Void Fields. The rusted key used to be way more inconsistent than it was before the anniversary update. It used to give an item from the lockbox, and the chances of getting an item quality that was good raised depending on how many keys you had. Although the keys didn't get consumed whenever you interacted with the box, the boxes were really hard to find and you had to stack a lot of keys in order to get any kind of value out of them. The newer ones work far better and I'm glad that they're super consistent and they are the way that they are. There are several broken statues of Providence on commencement likely due to Mithrix breaking them in a fit of rage after realizing he was trapped on the moon due to the actions of his brother, as mentioned in the Brittle Crown logbook. Alongside these statues, there's also remnants of constructs being forged by Mithrix. Plus some, uh... Before the Scorched Acres update, Sticky Bombs used to be way stronger and stacked way better than they do now, so the meta was to just get as many as possible. The way that they stacked was they had a 250% damage bonus, and then for each stack, it was additive, 125% per stack. This is even referenced in the logbook for the item when it was added in the Hidden Realms update. There's two logbooks in the game that imply that the Enforcer, or at least an Enforcer from the first game, are still alive during the events of Risk of Rain 2. The Rally Point Delta logbook talks about how the ship from the first game, the Contact Light, was overwhelmed by the forces of the planet, and the ATG logbook talks about someone, this being the Enforcer, finding his way out with a bunch of items crashed from the ship. Bandit was originally in the game files before the anniversary update, and he still had a lot of the same kit that was in the first game. For a while, the best way to play as Bandit was just to download the modded character, which is the visual you're seeing on screen right now. But hey, he's actually in the game now, so I mean, the mod's kind of obsolete, but if you want to see what his old kit was like, it's still pretty well made. Another one not on the original image, but as mercenary, it's possible to one-shot certain bosses using his dash. If you dash into a flying enemy like the Alloy Worship Unit or a Wandering Vagrant without sprinting, and have your hitbox be inside of the enemy in question at the end of your dash, it'll launch them in the same direction as your dash. If they come into contact with any surface, they'll get one-shot. Moving on to tier 4, it's going to be most of the same concepts, plus some extra unused content in the game files. Another one not on the iceberg, this is in reference to a hidden boss that you can fight if you meet certain requirements. The two requirements being that you get the Beads of Fealty item from the Lunar Shop and go into the Celestial Portal and obliterate at the Obelisk. Once done, you will be taken into a Moment Hole, and there you can find one of four differently named scavengers. Kip Kip the Gentle, Whip Whip the Wild, Twip Twip the Devotee, and Gura Gura the Lucky. 
Each one has their own unique item pool with lunar items being added. They are also one of the few enemies in game to not have their own logbook entry, unless if you count the artifact reliquary as an enemy. The only real lore relevance that they have is that they're likely followers of Mithrix that acted on his behalf in some way and used the beads of fealty to get to safety in awaiting Mithrix's return. The log for Exploder Lunar Chimeras references that it was made using a mixture scraped from the bottom of what is assumed to be broken Lunar Chimeras. The blue explosion it leaves after it dies is very similar to the blue flames from the Hellfire Tincture. The tar from abandoned aqueducts being parasitic is mostly referenced in the Clay Dune Strider, Mired Urn, and the abandoned aqueducts log itself. The way that it works is it grabs onto a host and throughout several days begins to turn them into what I assume is a beetle. Although for enemies like the Clay Templars, it's unclear whether the tar turns them into the Templars, or if they're native to the abandoned aqueducts themselves. For some reason, the jellyfish in the second game explode upon contact, but in the first game they did contact damage by dashing through you. Maybe the jellyfish in the second game remember the survivors from the first game, and are kind of an imperial Japan type society. Maybe they got some like strict moral code about honor, I don't know. Ancestral Incubator was the original yellow drop for grandparent that was never added to the main game. It spawned a friendly parent and even had its own unused logbook entry, which talked about how two people were discussing negotiations with parents, but the last time this was tried, it ended poorly. Grandparents were also unused in the game files before we had the version that we know today. It looked like a big melted parent with two heads and had two different attacks, one of them being a swipe and another that teleported the grandparent to a different location. In the game files, the name for Artifact of Frailty is Weak Ass Knees, the artifact that doubles fall damage and makes it fatal. The old design for parents looked a lot smaller and it looked like he had back problems and sat in a DX racer for too long. Now his design resembles that of the first game. The Solus Control Unit is a giant machine that flies from planet to planet in search of resources. It also produces smaller probes to harvest these resources with mining lasers attached to them. It then uses the resources collected to create more versions of itself. Just an aside, the boss item that it drops, the Empathy Cores, are a reference to the Personality Cores from the Portal series. I kinda hinted at this idea earlier, but Handy was actually intended to be in the base game of Risk of Rain 2, but it eventually changed into Multi. Coven of Gold is the name of an unused elite aspect. It didn't have any effect in game because all it did was just make you shiny, but it implies that there could have been some kind of gold elite. In the Brutal Crown logbook, there's a line spoken by Mithrix. It reads, She should have died for me. Her gift was wasted on you. The her in this context is Nukahana, and Nukahana is closely tied to death and balance, sacrificing for the greater balance of the rest of the world. With that in mind, we can kind of assume that the gift being used in this context on Mithrix, maybe he could have like gone to the planet and killed off the population for the sake of balance and then used that to build more automatons of war, and then using these newly built machines to go and conquer other planets. That's just my theory though. In actuality, it's Providence who receives the gift, and it's not really clear what the gift actually does. Another theory proposed is maybe he could use that gift to be keeping the residents of the planet there. His reasons for doing so could be the same reason that he didn't want Mithrix leading everything because he wanted to just destroy everything and Providence was really about preserving whatever he had and preserving the life that was on the planet. There's a lot to Nukahana, Mithrix, and Providence that I'm not really sure about. There's a channel I'll link in the description, Jardego Nex. He has a whole bunch of different lore videos explaining everything way better than I possibly can, so check them out. So these next three I'm going to talk about all at the same time because they all fall under the same concept of unused character that's in the game files. I'll start with Assassin since he's the most unfinished out of all the characters on here, but he was supposed to be some kind of like fast striking stealth based class, but he was very unfinished so there's not a whole lot to base his gameplay off of. Paladin was supposed to be a monster native to the planet that worshipped the survivor from the first game. In the game files, he had the model of a beetle guard with some blue on him and had a shield M2 that blocked hits from the front, similar to the Enforcer. However, there is a modded character that shares the same name, and he's a very tanky melee character with healing capabilities and a dash. He's really cool and one of my favorite modded characters. Plus, he has a bunch of skins that are related to the lore, which look really well done. Sniper had a decent amount of his kit finished, but was likely cut due to time constraints. He was a survivor from the first game and it would have been cool to see him in 3D, but there is a teaser for Survivors of the Void at the time of writing of the script that could mean he's added to the game, but I'll just have to wait and see. 
I already talked about Ibzan and the Bandit Mastery skin, so I'm just gonna move on. Orbital Laser was an unfinished equipment that called a laser from the sky to do damage, and I imagine it would have functioned somewhat like the laser turbine from the first game, but that's just speculation. Bird Sharks are the name of the flying creatures on distant roosts that you see in the background. They don't give gold or XP if you kill them, but they're just kind of there, and now you know that they are named Bird Sharks. And knowing is half the battle. He's going to... Reaper's Remorse was an unfinished equipment that was a ghost gun that shot for you, and I think it might have been this that was shown in the most recent Survivors of the Void trailer, which is number 24 at the time of recording. Watch me be dumb and get it wrong and look stupid on the internet, that'd be funny wouldn't it? So the life cycle of parents is supposed to replicate the life cycle of a star, but it's really weird and it goes something like this. Also just to preface, child is an enemy from the first game. The child lays the egg, the parent takes care of the grandparents, and the grandparents incubate the eggs, meaning that the grandparent is the youngest, and the young- er, fuck, what even is it? You're going 70 miles per hour! So grandparents are younger than the child. How long would it take you to drive 70 miles? But the child lays the egg. 70 neighbor. And the egg becomes the parent? So I think it goes egg- Parent, grandparent, child. <laughs> oh, one hour! Oh! This entry sucks, I'm moving on to tier 5. RuneScape had a similar puzzle with giant lizard men wearing bands, except there were three of them, and not two. I can't actually confirm whether or not this is true. I haven't played RuneScape for one, and I'm basing this off of the comment of the guy who posted the iceberg image. Affix Echo is an unused elite aspect that was introduced during the anniversary update in the game files. It spawns a few weaker pitch black clones of yourself that follow you around and attack enemies. During the events of Risk of Rain 1, in particular the intro cutscene, it shows Providence boarding the contact light and invading the ship and destroying it. If you add the context from Heretic's logbook, it can tell the story about how she tried to escape the planet by boarding the ship whenever Providence was attacking it. It seemed like she was able to avoid most conflict on the ship, and even get inside the captain's control room, but was eventually stopped by Providence himself and executed. Her reason for wanting to escape in the first place is probably due to figuring out that Providence was forcing them to stay on the planet and not see what lies beyond. And with the assistance of Mithrix and influence of his looter items, she saw the contact lights attack as a means of escape. Also, during her execution at the hands of Providence, it's implied that she was dismembered and became the heresy items that we know now. Her death serves as a reminder to the other denizens of the planet not to meddle with the corrupting powers of lunar items and to dispose of them in the cleansing pools in exchange for pearls. In the end credits for the game, you can find an unused artifact code and Hopu has gone on record saying it'll be used in a future update. Perhaps we'll see it in the Survivors of the Void update. Some of the lunar item logs, like Corpse Bloom and Shaped Glass, are translated by an in-game AI translation device called My Babel. This could mean that Mithrix and Providence have their own language and can either speak fluent English because of the events of the first game, or because the suits of the survivors have translation devices built into them, allowing them to understand English. The Shrine of Combat has a skull on it that doesn't resemble any other enemy in the game. However, the head shape of it does resemble the helmet that Artificer has, and Artificer and her kind clearly have some kind of history with the planet, so maybe the denizens have some kind of understanding about who she is, and use it to ward her off. This could also explain why enemies pop up whenever you interact with it, in the hopes of baiting Artificer into interacting with it and trying to kill her. Nukahana is a disease is a theory that revolves around the idea that the debuff that you get whenever you interact with a Malachite enemy is some kind of plague. The two main pieces of evidence for this are whenever you pick up the Malachite elite aspect, the character's head starts shaking rapidly, kind of like rabies in a way, and that the healing debuff that you get from it acts as somewhat of a sickness. Personally, I don't think this theory really lines up with the already established lore, but I think it's a cool way of integrating game mechanics into a theory. In a moment fractured, you can see three different islands out in the void, two of them having literal easter eggs on them. There's no achievements tied to getting to any of these islands, but if you want to get to them, turn up your gamma settings in game and it should be pretty easy to find all three. Several of the maps and alternative variants were outsourced to different companies. Most notably, Sunder Grove was part of a deal with Stadia where it was an exclusive map on that platform for a month, until it eventually got added to platforms that people actually play on. 
Like it's really cool to see Hopu get a big deal like that out of Google, but then it's on a platform that has Just Dance 2022 and Ben 10 Power Trip and like that's it. On certain maps, there's invisible geometry that can mess up your pings. In particular, Wetland Aspects has some giant stone platforms that will mess up the way pings are placed. And on Sky Meadows, you can look through the Primordial Teleporter and it looks like you put Risk of Rain 2 in a microwave. Lunar Coins being made by Mythrix could be a way of showing that like the denizens of the planet are able to trade in the coins for lunar items, and also shows like the Beads of Fealty being a show of faith to Mythrix. In a similar way, it also explains why the creatures on the planet are able to be influenced by Mythrix in the first place. So personally, I think this theory overall fits well with the lore, and it's one that I personally agree with. Primus 5 is a planet that's talked about in the old guillotine and crowdfunder item logbooks. The story goes is that the overlords of Primus 5 went to great lengths to break the will of the lower class and use the crowdfunder against them as a means of showing off their immense amounts of wealth. Eventually, these citizens were able to take back Primus 5 and executed the overlords, with the old guillotine itself being a symbol of this rebellion. We are now on tier 6. The logbook for Brass Contraptions talks about a redacted facility collaborating with another research center in observing these robotic automaton. They noted how they had advanced means of protecting themselves, but no known means of functioning. They stick out from almost every other monster type in the game, because not only do they not resemble any of the constructs that Mythrix makes, it doesn't resemble any other creatures that are on the planet as well. The Newt's arm appears disfigured and broken. There's nothing that in-game explains why this is the case, but in the Bizarre Between Times logbook, we know that it's something that isn't natural. The new has a bunch of unused dialogue lines for buying items in the shop and also upgrading items, which is something that was never added to the game. I'll put all the lines of dialogue on screen, you can pause and read them, but it's a shame to see that these were never actually added, because it would have been cool to see them talk. Nevermore is the name of the heretic's actual skills since her true skills are given to her by the heresy items. It's a one second cooldown and it lets out a little bird noise whenever you use it. I'll play a clip of it now. Wisps are created using some kind of powder, but in the logbook entries for the lesser and greater wisps, powder seems to be redacting something. Wisps are also considered spirits in folklore, so maybe the powder is actually the souls of the dead. The souls could range from native creatures on the planet itself, or maybe even the survivors that have died. There's a rally point delta, and the logbook for Titanic Plains mentions there being a rally point beta. This rally point, however, was likely taken in by the planet, and specifically the stone titans, which would explain why there isn't any remnants of it on Titanic Plains. However, if we continue with the naming convention of it being based off of Greek letters, we'd have Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Whatever happened to the other two? There's an unused asset of Mythrix where he's made of glass and he doesn't have a helmet on. It's not explained what it's used for at all, but it could have been a potential fourth phase involving cloned versions of himself. However, nothing in the game files can actually confirm whether that be the case. In the cinematic trailer for the game, you can see a shadow of a giant creature. It's theorized that this is how Mythrix would have originally been designed before it was altered to the one that we know today. However, this could be something completely different and we just have no idea and it was never actually implemented at all. Every single enemy in the game is programmed so they can use items and skills and it's possible to play as them using commands or cheats. The Lumerian mod by Timmy has a complete version of a bunch of these characters with alternate abilities that's really good. Mythrix being three Mythrax is just a technicality with how each phase is technically a different Mythrix. There isn't actually any lore implications with this. The new commencement is actually a separate map from the old version of itself, which is why you have to re-unlock the environment log if you've done it before the anniversary update. The old version is still in the game files, but requires commands or mods to access. Moving on to tier 7. Hauler Body is a giant car asset that was in the game files that is presumably used to test the terrain of certain maps. It had standard vehicle controls similar to that of most games, but its handling was rather iffy. It's possible to play on the main menu as a stage, but it doesn't have a teleporter and the camera angle is fixed in one direction, so it's hard to move around. It's possible to play it on modded, for example if you have custom stages in your mod list and you play the game, and go into the bazaar between time and select the seer portal that's empty, 
you'll be warped to this stage. However, it's going to soft lock your run since you can't progress past it. There's transparent plants growing on the moon and they also appear out of Mithric's helmet once you beat him in the end cinematic. There could be some connection between the plant glass here and items like shaped glass, but it's unclear if that's actually the case. The details for this were kind of skimmed over whenever I talked about Aurelianite, but based on the time frame in the Halcyon Seed logbook, Aurelianite's just a baby. His full grown form could have been even stronger and more dangerous, potentially being stronger than Providence and Mithrix combined. Saturian Bison, or Bighorn Bison of Rademia, were poached to near extinction by humans, and their logbook talks about how they mysteriously disappeared from their natural habitats. It's assumed that Providence used the teleporters to take them to Peshator 5 in order to save them. The Moki Chrysalis used the actual placement position of the item itself on your character to determine how it would fly. So characters without item displays would have infinite flight with it. So characters like Heretic and Goku would be able to fly forever with it. The same rings that show up on titanic plants are also present in the void fields. With the trend of Void Reavers stealing stuff, it wouldn't be surprising if they were able to take whole chunks of the planet and teleport them into the Void. Ifrit was a boss in the first game, and the only reference to him in the second game is the elite aspect for Fire Elites, being Ifrit's distinction. Ifrit doesn't have a lot of lore in Risk of Rain, but it's speculated that his design was made by a Kickstarter backer through a backer reward. The logs for the Imp and Imp Overlord both reference a dimension of sorts that they originate from. It's unclear how it works exactly, but you can see both of these creatures getting sucked back into the dimension whenever they die. The imps being misunderstood is referenced in the imp logbook where it's talked about how they hate Providence and they want to escape him. However, the same translation device that's used to translate lunar items doesn't work for the imps language. On the old version of Commencement, there was a giant red pillar on the Cauldron Island that stood out from everything else. But with the release of the anniversary update, it was discovered that this was a pillar of blood, one of the many pillars used to actually get up to Mithrix. Tier 8 is up next, and here's where some more out there ideas come in. Imps coming from a fascist society refers to the Imp Overlord logbook, where it talks about how the imps are in search of a kind of artifact. In their pursuit of this artifact, they report to the Overlord, who barks orders at them due to their failures. They are generally treated with disdain and almost a kind of hatred. Mythrix and Newt working together is pretty interesting if you consider the Lunar Coins being brought to the Newt as an act of gauging loyalty, because then the Newt can be viewed as a middle guy acting on behalf of Mythrix. It's also interesting to view it as a way of Mythrix covering his own tracks and not drawing the attention of Providence, even though he's already dead. This is the theory that mini mushrooms are more like actual mushroom plants and not like mushroom animal hybrids. The argument for this is that they operate on instinct in a way most plants do and that their glowing underside indicates that they're dangerous to eat. They're also not meant to move around very much due to their short and stubby legs. Before the 1.0 update, there was a poll to determine who would be the next character added to the game with one of the options being to add a brand new survivor. The idea is, since the vote was held over Discord, it's possible to fake votes by endlessly creating new Discord accounts and voting for the new character, along with the idea that Captain was always going to be added to the game since he's really significant to the lore. However, this definitely isn't the case and it's probably just a bunch of chef mains being mad over the fact that he didn't get added. The slipstream is kind of a weird one, but it's based on how the newt got into the bazaar and his species as a whole. Newts are a species that are capable of traveling through the slipstream using magnetic webs, and the newt that we know fell behind because he has a broken arm and he's blind and he just sucks. As a result, he branches off from the rest of the newts and finds the tide pool, which he's very familiar with, as referenced in the Bizarre Between Time logbook. He seeks refuge here and is very familiar with the place, and at the end of the logbook, it referenced a pale arm reaching through the tide pool, which we assume is Mithrix. But going back to the slipstream itself, it seems like it's some kind of pocket dimension outside of time and it's not really clear where it is or how it works. So the only real concrete evidence that Newt makes the lunar items is the fact that Tincture is mentioned in the Bazaar Between Time logbook and the Pale Arm mentioned earlier. The whole thing doesn't really make a whole lot of sense if you view Newt as someone who's independent of the moon side of the lunar items. 
I personally don't really agree with this theory, so I'm just gonna move on. AI test was a new map added in the anniversary update used to test AI. The only thing on it was a friendly lunar chimera that would follow you around. It was accidentally added to the logbooks and is the reason why you have a blank spot in it. Even if you forcibly obtain the log for the stage, it won't actually unlock anything. This is it, Luigi. We're almost at the bottom of the iceberg with tier 9. Providence and Mythrix don't actually die, they just kind of teleport out or vanish and don't leave a corpse behind. Of course, this could just be a way of showing their death dramatically, but I don't think they'd die that easily since we don't fully understand what their species is and they're kind of gods. I'm going to talk about these two together since they both have the overarching idea of Captain being very important. So the idea of Captain retelling the events of the first game means that he's already experienced these, and in a bunch of different logs, he always talks about what a great story this will be. However, this idea doesn't really make any sense and it has a bunch of holes in it, so I'm just going to move on to the next point. Captain being the main character has a lot more legs to stand on since the intro cutscene starts out with the Captain and he has a lot of spoken dialogue in-game. And the whole point of Risk of Rain 2 is the fact that you're going back to the planet to recover cargo and Captain is leading a rescue mission on the UES safe travels. This idea at least has some leverage just because Captain is so important to the story and he's literally the one taking people back to the planet in the first place. Sadly, I don't think there's a lot of connecting through line for the Deadbolt and Risk of Rain universe, but if Deadbolt took place in the past, like way before the events of Risk of Rain, then I guess it could work, I'm not sure. The entire point of Risk of Rain 2 is that you're on a cargo recovery mission, and I'm assuming all the residents just think you're a bloodthirsty monster out for them. All of this could be avoided if you just had some means of communicating, although that wouldn't make the game very fun. I do enjoy stealing a lizard's lunch money and using it to open funny boxes. We're on to the final tier, and there's only one item on it. This one is about the logbook for Transcendence, and I'm just going to read the whole thing. You are trying your best to survive. You consider yourself a fast learner. You have been feeling lucky. You have been experiencing feelings of deja vu. If you understand, do not read the next paragraph. You are taking control of your own beliefs. You feel familiar in unfamiliar environments. You have been gaining an intuition for experiences you've never had. You ponder a past life. If you understand, do not read the next paragraph. You find yourself searching for things that never have been. You miss things you have never had. You play characters that have never lived. You have been experiencing feelings of deja vu. If you understand, do not read the next paragraph. You have revealed my hand. Because you have consumed this information, the observers will now consume it in time. If you are reading this paragraph, I will be long dead. But in turn, you will have freed me. I will no longer exist in my universe. There will be no proof that I ever was, but I exist now in yours. I have escaped my suffering. Keep me safe. I hope you do not understand. And that's the entire Risk of Rain 2 iceberg, plus a little bit extra. Risk of Rain 2 is a game I personally really enjoy and spent a lot of time playing, and I hope the devs do really well going forward with the Survivors of the Void update and all that. This is the first time I've ever made a video ever, and if it weren't for a game like Risk of Rain 2, I wouldn't feel inspired to make it. And whoever is watching out there, thanks for watching.